It's exciting to see you guys. I have missed Momentum. Um, it has been three weeks since I've been here, and that is wild to me. So, hello. I'm, I, I'm excited to be back. Um, I heard we had an amazing uh, two messages while I was gone with Travis uh, preaching. I heard you guys covered an entire book of the Bible in one night. So you know that was spiritual. And then, uh, and then also Pastor Kyle bringing the word last week. I heard it was a phenomenal message. Anytime he talks about God, it makes you feel like you don't know God, and Kyle does. And it's always exciting to be inspired to know God more. And so I'm kidding. I love you guys. No, that is super awesome. It's, it's really comforting to know um, that when I leave, uh, there is, uh, you don't go down any. Uh, you actually get better preachers and better men of God come out here and, uh, and speak. So that is truly, truly exciting. Hey, just a couple of announcements. Uh, I know we don't have the video today because they're really quick, but take these down. Um, one, first of all, August 9th, uh, our Remount campus, which is located on Remount Road in North Charleston, uh, kind of our outreach-driven church um, that does things for the inner city, they're having their back-to-school bash um, on August 9th, which means we'll be handing out um, book bags and school supplies to about 600 or more children who don't um, get these things, that don't have these things. We uh, bless the community. And so we're going to go down there and serve. So August 9th, an outreach, that is a Saturday. It'll be in the morning. We'll get you um, more information. If you come here on Sunday morning or any of the campuses, you can sign your name to get all of that information um, emailed or text to you in our main um, sanctuary foyer. So make sure you do that. And then finally, my favorite, August 2nd. Coming up, it's a Saturday, August 2nd, the week before. Um, we're going to do a momentum trip to the beach. Uh, we're having a beach day for momentum. So make sure August 2nd at 10 a.m., we're going to meet right here at the church. We're going to carpool. We're not sure why it's called carpool, but um, we know people ride together. And uh, we're going to go all the way down uh, to, I chose Folly Beach. I know Isle of Palms is better because it has showers and things, but Folly Beach, there's a hope for waves. And so, uh, so make sure you come out August 2nd. It's going to be awesome. Cool? Word. Bring your surfboard or your boogie board or your stomach for surfing. So, uh, so bring any of those things, and you should be able to either body surf, boogie board, or surf. And, uh, and if you don't know how to surf, um, boogie board. So uh, you thought you were about to learn. You got excited. But no, it, I'm excited tonight. Hey, tonight I just want to share a message. It's not a part of a series. We're going to be starting a new series next week. Um, but this week I just kind of want to share uh, kind of my heart, where I've been for the past three weeks. Um, I've been doing the best part of my job, and that is I get paid to hang out with teenagers at youth camps. And uh, it is the best part of my job. We go to um, up in, where is it, Green Honey, Honey a Path? Home. No, 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 no. It's Honey of Path. Uh, we're going to say that. Um, but we go to the Honey of Path, South Carolina. We do uh, youth camps. This year was phenomenal. We sold out of both camps. Um, there was not an empty bunk in the camp because of how many students, 300 um, plus students in both camps. It was the biggest camp South Carolina has ever seen. And it was amazing, uh, unbelievable speakers, unbelievable moments with God. I need water. And uh, so it was unbelievable. And it's my favorite time of year because for some reason, go to the country up in the mountains, go in this crappy gym, put some lights up there and a good band and a regular speaker, and people go nuts for Jesus. It's crazy to me. It is unbelievable. But that's why it's my favorite is because you see the potential God has for our generation because uh, it may not exist all the time. It may not happen throughout the year, but you do see what is possible um, in God. And so that's exciting. And tonight I just want to kind of share that moment. Because many of you, maybe growing up, you, were, you grew up in church. You went to youth group. That's awesome. I didn't. I'm kind of jealous, but I get to do it for a living now. Um, but it's kind of cool. Uh, but, but for me, uh, many of you may be used to those moments. And this year may have been the first year you didn't get one of those moments. Oh, thanks, dude. That's super awesome. Cool. Um, I'm excited about that. Uh, but thank you. Um, but, but we had these moments. You may have had these moments, and it was kind of what you needed every single year to get back on track. But this year, you didn't have that. And today I want to talk to you about being tired, about being weary, about finding yourself in a place with God that maybe is tough. Maybe you're kind of in that place where you're like, man, I'm trying my hardest. I'm doing everything I can. But in reality, it kind of stinks. And so if you can, open your Bibles to Acts chapter 18, and as you get there, um, make sure you're ready, because we're going to read verses 1 through 11. So 11 verses, but I hear this is nothing compared to covering an entire book of the Bible. So we can handle this. Amen? Got some ice in there. Cool. 
You there? It's going to be on the screens, if not. Um, Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 11. Follow along, stay with me, and uh, realize there's a lot of names. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife, Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker, as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. But when the Jews opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I'm clear of my responsibility. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to Titus Justice, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue ruler, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard him believed and were baptized. Listen to this. This is where I want to stay tonight. Verses 9 through 11, it says this. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed for half a year, a year and a half, teaching the word of God. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your word. God, without your word, um, how would we know you? God, without your word, how would we be so blessed to, to share your gospel? So God, we thank you for your word. God, your word, God, is a light unto our path. And God, we ask that tonight, God, you would illuminate in our minds, and our hearts, God, who you truly are. God, we pray that tonight truth would be the only thing that has precedence, that only speaks in this place. God, we give you all the glory. We thank you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen, amen. Tonight I want to ask you a question. How many of you enjoy running? You're like runners. You're like running is a hobby for you. Uh, not many, of course. Running is terrible. Um, tonight, <laughs> I, I want to let you know, running is absolutely terrible to me. I, and you can probably tell per my frame. But running is just not my go-to. Uh, growing up, I was an athlete. Many of you know that. I played baseball. And the worst time of every single year for me was conditioning. Any athletes, you know what I'm talking about, conditioning time. Conditioning is pretty much means this. The coach has the ability just to tell you to run because he wants to. And, and for me, I don't know about you guys, but all of my coaches were overweight, and it always made me want to talk to them and be like, for real? Like, you're, you're pushing me to run. <laughs> no one could even push you. Like, but, but anyway... <laughs> Hello. <laughs> but but I, I just always struggle with conditioning. Conditioning was the worst. For me, when I run, it's cool at the beginning. I have like a, a nice, I feel like I have nice form and everything. I'm going well. But after about like .01 miles, uh, we start getting into the part that becomes rough for me. And I don't know about you guys. Maybe this is just me. But weird things happen to me when I start running long distances. Normal people, you just run and abs slowly chisel out of your chest. Um, for me... My entire body becomes blood red, like red as ever. I'm like red. I sweat while standing, let alone running. Um, I am like drenched. I'm blood red. And, and one day, I was in high school. This is my favorite memory. We had to run two miles in a certain amount of time for baseball. And so I was like, why? We run 90 feet. Like, why? What is this? But anyways, so I was like, whatever, I'll do it. And so we're running on mile number one. It was the worst. Like, third lap, it was four laps around our track was one mile. On the third lap, I'm literally, I forgot how to breathe. Like, I'm, you know how you have to start making yourself breathe? You're, like, now dependent on yourself remembering to breathe. I, I'm, like, on lap number three, and I get going. My whole body is red, and all of a sudden, my arms and legs begin to go numb. And I'm literally, I feel like I'm just kind of floating, and I'm just, like, going. All of a sudden, my form that looks kind of nice, I feel like I'm, like, like just going. And I'm literally, like, struggling right away. And what made me mad is, like, I'm going, and I'm like, is no one else hurting? And I look back, and there's, like, one more dude. He's the heavy set left fielder that just hits bombs. Uh, but <laughs> he's back there, but everyone else is in front of me. And, and I look, and some people are just, like, talking and having conversations, like, <laughs> laughing and giant. And I'm literally... Uh, debating whether or not I should quit because I might die. Like, I literally feel like I might die. When I start taking gas. You know when you get really tired, it's past like, <sighs> like that. It gets to the, <gasps> like, you get like that. You know what I'm talking about? Like, you, <laughs> and you forget how to get it out. So you're like, 
<sighs> and you're like, you're struggling. It, I was at that point. But then this crazy thing happened. If you're a runner, you know about this. In the beginning, you get to that place, but all of a sudden, something shifts. And you get what they call a second wind. You guys know what I'm talking about, the second wind. On lap number three, I'm going, and as I come by the coach, every time I would get by the coach, I don't know about you guys, but I just had something to prove. Every time I get by the coach, I'd sprint, like feeling like I'm all good. And so lap number three, I'm coming around, and I'm like dying. So I just held my breath so he wouldn't hear me breathing because I sounded like a dying mule. And, uh, and But I came around, I held my breath, and I ran as fast as I could. But when I came back out the other side, finally took my first breath, I had this, all of a sudden, this second wind. Like something else had happened. Like all of a sudden, new breath and new life had been literally just like poured inside of me. And that lasted for like a whole half a lap. And so it was exciting. But that moment, you guys know what I'm talking about, that second wind moment. So I don't want to talk to you about a spiritual second wind. Because oftentimes what takes place, if you think about your life as a believer, there's that exciting ex- explosion that happens when you, when you realize that Jesus loves you, that he died for you. There's this excitement, there's this tenacity to see something big happen. There's this thing where we'll chase anything, we'll do anything. But all of a sudden it begins to fizzle. Life kind of creeps in, hardships come. Because I don't know about you, maybe it's been the same way for you, but many people just in the moments when they get their life right, It seems like the circumstances go bad. It's like, God, I'm trying to do what's right, but everything else starts falling apart. And you're like, you know what? If I just go back to doing what's wrong, maybe my life will just be a little bit easier. Like, I don't get why this goes like this. But it seems like everything gets rough. And what we need is that spiritual second wind. We need that extra hope. We don't need to get saved again, though that's what takes place many times at these camps that I'm talking about. Uh, these crazy things where everyone feels like they got to go back and recommit, recommit, recommit. But what we actually need is not to get saved all over again. We need to be just filled with joy again, filled with excitement again. A reminder, our perception must go back to where it was before when nothing else mattered because you had just met Jesus. And as we look at our passage, we just read a passage of Paul. And Paul's in this place where literally Paul is ready to give up. Acts chapter 18, Paul is going through some crazy stuff. Now, if you think you as a Christian have gone through a lot, we're about to go through some of the things that Paul has just gone through. And I'm going to remind you, if you've been through this stuff, you need to preach next week. So, uh, because it's, it's wild what he's going through. Acts chapter 18, Paul's on his second missionary journey. He's arriving at Athens, or to Corinth. He's leaving Athens to go to Corinth. He's experiencing a low time. He's depressed. This guy is literally down because he's doing so much with zero fruit. And I don't know if you've ever done something, maybe you've poured into someone's life, and you've done something so much, and there was no fruit that came out of it. It's discouraging. It's discouraging when you pour your life into something and and nothing produces. And that's kind of where Paul is at. And it says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. It says, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Pretty much can be translated as this. I was far from strong. I was nervous. I was rather shaky. And I was about to get killed out there. Like I'm literally dying. Paul is going through this stuff. Now here's what I want you to realize. We read Paul went from Athens to Corinth. And we're like, oh, that's kind of cool. We forget. Guys, cars were not around. We got to remember these things in the Bible. Cars were not there. Paul didn't ride up. It was like, what's up? I got my tents. What's up? Good to see you guys. No, he walked. And if you actually go look at a map, Athens to Corinth would have been 53 miles of rugged terrain. 53 miles. I have still to this day in my pure existence of living, I don't think I've hit 53 miles of walking yet. And if I have, I'm impressed with myself. The 53 miles, I would say Paul might be a little bit tired. He's a little bit tired. He's going through this. Uh, That mile, those 53 miles, this time actually Paul was alone. Now, I don't know about you guys. I've talked about it before, but if you, has anyone ever gone on a vacation and you drove by yourself for a long amount of time? You know those conversations you start having with yourself. They're not normal. Six hours in a car, and I'm, I'm like, talking about weird junk. Like, Tyler, you, you're starting to look a little thin. Like, you're looking good in here right now. And then all of a sudden you're wanting to take up new hobbies. You pass by, like, you see this thing, like, knitting is for the future. And you're like, I could get into knitting. I'm into knitting. Like, I'm exciting. Like, you, you start thinking these different things. You, he's, his mind is going crazy. He's down. He's depressed about what's taking place. He's now walked 53 miles all alone. This is where Paul's at. But not only that, 
He was also bivocational. So your job that is getting on your nerves and you just can't handle anymore because your boss keeps talking to you and he says this one thing to you every time and it just ruins your day. All of that, but he's actually doing two of those. He's preaching in the synagogue every single week. And if you don't know about that, I'll give you a sermon to preach, to prepare. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes pouring yourself out. But then something also. He's a tent maker. This dude's setting up tents all the time. He's traveling, going places for the games that are taking place at that time. And he's setting up tents. He's doing manual labor. And then it says he's also pressed. Verse 5 says he's pressed in the spirit. There's a spiritual stress going on in his life. He's at that place. You might know about these moments, these spiritual stress moments, but maybe those times when you're kind of wrestling with God about something. Maybe those times when you're crying out to God to help and it doesn't seem like he's even there. Those times where you're literally, you're like, God, I just need something to happen. Give me a sign. Do something. He's at this moment. He has a sense of failure because he was called a babbler in the city he just came from. In Athens, they were like, get out of here. You're an idiot. What you're speaking is stupid. They're telling him to get out. Everything about this guy is frustrated. But not only that, he leaves, and he leaves Athens, and he goes to a place called Corinth. Now, if you don't know about Corinth, it's actually a peninsula. And Corinth would have been one of the leading trade spots in the world because it had water, uh, two of the best bodies of water as far as transporting goods on both sides. It literally is in the best place possible. Corinth is right where you want it to be, which means this. When there's good trade, there's tons of different types of people. And with those different types of people come different lifestyles, come different gods, come different everything. And so Paul is going to a place where all kinds of different things. One of the main gods at this time would have been Aphrodite, the goddess of love, or the goddess of do whatever makes you feel good. And so we, we got this place, and Paul's there. And I tell you all of this because I'm trying to make you understand. Paul is in a tough time. Think of your toughest time. If it beats that, like I said, you're preaching next week. Like, it's tough. It's going crazy. He's also been abused, physically abused for what he's been doing, verbally abused for what he's been doing. Paul's in a tough spot, feels underappreciated, feels like he's lonely. Second Corinthians, he refers to, he reminds them of this. He says, I will, be, I will very, very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. The more I do for you, the less you do for me. The more I show you love, the more I care for you, the less you care for me. He's in a terrible spot. He's been jailed. He's been persecuted, ridiculed. And now he has to face Sin City. He's headed to the place where it's known for its sin. And Paul gets there, and he says these things. I'm ready to quit. I'm done. I'm I'm done with all of this. I'm tired of this. I've done too much. I've done all of this stuff, and it's not working. I'm finished. And I don't know about you. I don't know about your walk with God, but I, I definitely know in my life there's been those moments. It may have been because I was doing a lot, and it seemed like nothing was coming back. And I'm like, God, oh, this is a waste of my time. I'm finished. Or maybe it seemed like when you got your life right, everything began to crumble, and everything about you just wants to give up. But today, I want to let you know that God responds in one sentence to Paul. And in one sentence, he gives Paul every single thing he needs to continue on. And today I want to look at those because here's what I know. Is that as believers, especially young adults, there's a lot of things going on in your life that can drag you down. They can get you in a tough spot. They can get you in a place where it's rough. It's hard. You feel beaten up. You feel bruised. Many of you, you may have been trying to do the right thing and family might have come against you. You might have done the right thing in your workplaces and, and your work. everyone in your work is just against you. You might have done what's right in your church and it seems like, man, everyone's still beating up on you even in the church. I know that each one of us are at this place at some point in our life. But I want to give you three things that God gives to Paul that I believe are for us to remind us that he's there, that he cares. The first is this. In verse 10, he answers first with, for I am with you. Today, I want to let you know that the first promise we have, we have the promise of God's presence in our lives. You see, too often we mistakenly put God's presence only at the places of worship, only at the places that we experience God, and we forget that God is everywhere at all times. And no matter where you are, what you're going through, God is with you. 
He reminds us many times. In the beginning, he says, I'm Emmanuel, God with us. His name even says that he's with us. In a tough time, in the Great Commission, he says, I am with you always. As you go, as you do what I called you to do, I'm always with you. And there's many promises that God is always with us. You see, some of us, in our moments of, of uh, those tough times, the majority of people feel lonely. Like, I'm the only one going through this. I'm the only one that's experiencing this. I want you to know that in your valley, when you feel defeated, discouraged, when you're sick, when you have financial heartaches, when there's family problems, remember that the God of the mountain is also the God of the valley, that God is never changing. That the moments when everything was going great, when everything was just how you wanted it, that same God is the God with you when everything's falling apart. God is never changing. He's always with us. I want to let you know that no matter how you feel, God is the same. And in the moments when we don't feel God, in those hardest moments when it seems like God has forgotten you, he's still with you. He's right beside you. When you feel beat up, he's with you. One of the moments, one of the moments in Scripture that reminds me of this the most, that shows me how much God truly does care, how much he cares for even our loneliness, the, those tough times we go through, is, a, is the story of Lazarus in John chapter 11. When we ask this question, the shortest verse in Scripture, Jesus wept. And it just tells us that, and there it could be these questions of like, why, why would he do this? Why would that happen? He knew he was going to raise him back from the dead. He's God. And we have all of these conversations. But what we forget is the main point, and that is he did it. He wept because he cared. His people were hurting. The people he loved were hurting. So why not weep? When the people look like there's nothing left, there's no hope, he sees them broken, and his heart breaks. And this reminds me that when God sees us broken, when he sees you in your tough times, when he sees you down, when it seems like the whole world's against you, and you're in that place of loneliness, almost to the place where you feel like you even want to give up, God looks at you, and he cares. He cares about even those small problems to everyone else, but big problems to you. God cares. We have the promise of his presence. God is always with us. You see, Paul was going through a tough time, and God's first thing is this. And the time when people would have been saying, Paul, you're wrong. What you're saying is wrong. Jesus may not even be God, they're saying. All of these people are doing this. They're abusing him. He's being jailed for his faith. This is what the first thing God says to him. Hey, Paul, I'm with you. I'm still here. The same God you experienced on that road that changed your entire life. The same God that has done the miracles through your life. The same God that has brought you out of your darkness. I'm still here. And listen, I want to tell you, the same God that met you where you were at the first time, the same God that, that called you out of a crowd, the same God that spoke life into you, the same God that found you in your depression and brought joy into your life, that same God is still with you. We have the promise of his presence. He goes on in verse 10 and says this. He says, and no man is going to attack and harm you. You see, at this time, Paul is being attacked, and I want to let you know that it actually shows that later in life, Paul would be attacked again. But for this moment, God offers this. He offers his protection. God offers his protection. I think it's funny the language that he uses. It says, no man is going to attack and harm you. And I used to ask, why doesn't he use the word or? And it implies that they're both one and the same. And so I think what God is really actually trying to say here is not, hey, people are going to mess with you. People are going to do things to you. People might do something to you, but, but I'm the God overall. I got you. It's a, it's a reminder that things might actually happen to you, but ultimately to remember that God's the ultimate authority over all things, and he's got you. He tells him, hey, I, I've got this. This is, reminds me of moments. The Apostle Paul, at the end of his time, he says, I have finished my course. You see, God... Through all the pain, through all the hurt, through all the abuse, God got him all the way through until he knew he was finished. The same with Jesus. Jesus at, at his last moment, he's being bruised, he's being beaten, he's done everything. He's up on the cross, and what does he finally say? It is finished. You see, God took them through. He supplied everything they needed until the time where they had done exactly what he had created them to do. And then he took them. You see, in your harm, in your moments of going through tough times, when people harm you, when thing, bad things happen to you, I, I hope you remember that it's not finished until God says it's finished. Nothing controls that other than God. It's never finished unless God says it is finished. 
See, I believe God has a, a purpose for each one of our lives. That God has an ultimate purpose with humanity, and he accomplishes it through individual purposes of man. And he begins to use men and women, and he takes them, and he puts them where, they, where he wants them. And he, he takes obedient people, and he says, go do this. And he, he begins to bless what they do, and miracles happen out of simple acts of obedience. There's a phrase that we often hear. To live is Christ and to die is gain. And I think that motto must be constantly reminded in our minds that, man, to, to remember that no matter what people do, no matter what actually happens in this carnal life, the only thing that really matters, true life is only found in Jesus. And death only leads us back to him. Everything gets us back to Jesus. I've heard it said, and I, I, this quote really kind of helps me with God's protection. Listen closely, it says this. Ahead of us, he's our guide. Behind us, he's our guard. Under us are his everlasting arms, and above us, if we'll look up, he's ever present with us in a cloud of glory. God's always with us. He's protecting us. He's got you. Listen, God's protection doesn't mean you won't experience hardships. God's protection doesn't mean bad things won't happen to you. God's protection means, man, I'm with you, and ultimately I'm in control of what takes place, and I'll see you through what I want to see you through. Too often we think that if something bad's happening to us, it's not of God. I, I just want to remind you, man, trials and temptations will come, but God is always with us. God will give you his presence. God will give you his protection. And finally, he says this to Paul. He says, the last part of verse 10, he says this, because I have many people in this city. And if you reread re this, it's like, oh, that's awesome. But we forget he's in Corinth, Sin City. There's no people there that actually love God. And God's, he's like, hey, I got many people in the city. And I can imagine Paul going, oh, T, T, time out. Who? What, what, how, why does this, this doesn't make sense. Like, why would he say I have many people in the city? They're all living for different gods. They're going to this God and then this God and then this God. It's tons of, of literally idol worship everywhere. Why would God say I have people in this city? See, I believe it's this. Because God views our lives not through necessarily where we're at, but where the potential of where we will be. You see, we have God's potential also. God's potential. That God saw this city, and he didn't just see where they were, but he saw where they would eventually become. How do we know this? If you read, I want to read a verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm going to read it in the message version because I love the way it says it. It says this. Don't you realize that this is not the way to live? Unjust people who don't care about God will not be joining in his kingdom. Those who use and abuse each other, use and abuse sex, use and abuse the earth and everything in it, don't qualify as citizens in the God's kingdom. A number of you know from experience what I'm talking about. For not so long ago, you were on that list. Since then, you've been cleansed up and you've been given a fresh start by Jesus, our master, our Messiah, and by our God, present in us, the Spirit. What does this mean? If you, if you don't see this happening, it's an amazing thing. This is spoken a couple years after the passage that we read in Acts. And what it tells you is this, is that the work that Paul stayed and did in Corinth saw fruit. And God said that these are my people because he knew where they would eventually be. Because Paul is pronouncing, you were once idolaters, you were once stuck in your sin, but now you're free. Re revival happened in the lives of people. And listen, that revival doesn't happen unless Paul stays and proclaims the gospel. You see, I believe this about many of our lives, is that God may have us in a rough place so that he can remind us of who he is, that he's always there. That he can remind us that ultimately he's in control, and then he can show us there's much more to our life than just existing. You see, we can experience the potential of God. It says Paul's response to this, Simply in verse 11 was this. So Paul stayed for a year and a half teaching the word of God. He was beat down. He was broken. He was ready to quit. Everything was going wrong. He had no reason to stay. But one sentence from God changed everything because God reminded him, you got my presence. You got my protection. And guess what? You got my potential. There's much more in you than you understand. And there's much more in them than you understand. 